All right. So Sam Redmond, PhD, is a historian and professor in the Hi Department of History at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He's the author of Bone Rooms from Scientific Racism to Human Prehistory in Museums and Prophets and Ghosts, the Story of Salvage Anthropology, both with Harvard University Press. At UMass, he teaches courses on modern U.S. history, public history, and oral history, and he lives in Northampton with his son, Owen. So welcome, Sam. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Can folks hear me all right? Okay, good. Now I'm going to pull up my presentation and share my screen. Okay. We might hear my dog snoring gently during the presentation, but um, that's better than barking, the alternative. Um, okay, can folks see the slides okay? All right, so uh, here we are today talking about uh, my new book, Prophets and Ghosts, uh, The Story of Salvage Anthropology. I wanna acknowledge as I begin on the outset that here I am in Northampton, Massachusetts uh, on the ancestral lands of the Nonotuck people. Uh, and we'll be talking and thinking a great deal about the history and legacy of uh, those connections uh, throughout the course of our conversation. But I want to begin by thanking uh, the museum, the staff, the city of Holyoke for uh, having me uh, today to talk about this project. And um, this is, uh, uh, as was indicated, you know, my second book project, I've been interested in the history of museums for a long time. Uh, and that's reflected in a, a book that's coming up as well that's on the history of crisis as it relates to museums over the course of the last century. Everything from pandemic and war uh, to uh, philosophical crises and, and other stories in museums. So that book comes out with NYU Press in, in April. But here today, we're, we're here talking about uh, this book in the middle, Prophets and Ghosts, the story of salvage anthropology. So as I mentioned, I've been interested in the history of museums for uh, quite some time. And uh, I'm interested in them for a variety of reasons, but I find photographs like this to be really uh, uh, remarkable. So this is a photograph from 1921, I think late in the year based on uh, the, the, the heavier clothing that people are wearing. Um, uh, 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 it, this is in Chicago uh, at the opening of the new Field Museum building. Uh, so this is a major natural history museum. And what's remarkable is if, if you go to this museum today, it's, it's, it feels like it's in the middle of the city. It's, it's on what's called the near south side. Um, but uh, in this moment, it was sort of created uh, to, in a new part of town in some ways. Uh, and it's, it's this grand monumental building with thousands of people lined up to go see this. Uh, this is an era uh, before, of course, the, the internet and uh, major cultural events that we sort of take for granted as bringing us together, you know, things like uh, the Super Bowl, uh, the Olympics is sort of in its modern iteration already getting going, but, um, you know, the radio is only sort of burgeoning at this time, magazines are becoming more like they are today, uh, but there's a much, much fewer ways in which people encounter or access ideas from around the world, uh, and these monumental structures sort of indicate how important museums were in the late 19th and early 20th century. Again, uh, with some inspiration from Europe uh, in terms of its architectural style, in terms of the symbols that are imbued in this, um, but also you know, in terms of the method and, and format for organizing these museums. Um, Okay, and of course, though these aren't places that are just you know uh, in in from in historic periods, right? These continue in many cases, such as the Field Museum in the same building, to be these vibrant cultural centers where thousands of people from across the Midwest and, and the city of Chicago and across the country and world travel uh, across you know uh, uh, to to experience this institution, right? It's got the largest T Rex uh, ever discovered. It has material from uh, geologic discoveries from around the world. And of course, it has wings devoted to archaeology and anthropology, or the study of archaeology being the study of our material history and material remains, and anthropology being the vast study of mankind, right? And you can see glimpses of that in this photograph with uh, the, uh, the totem poles from the Pacific Northwest, or the oceanic material uh, here in, in the way back. But 
Uh, I, for a long time, have been interested in, in how people have learned about Native American cultures in these spaces. And uh, it, it struck me as significant and consequential, right, that um, over the course of the 19th and 20th century, these massive collections were built up in, the, in museums like the Field Museum, and then thousands of people, uh, uh, Euro-Americans, white people especially, but uh, uh, people from around the world uh, started to learn about Native Americans in a particular way in these spaces. And uh, it, it struck me that probably there was uh, a lot of bad inherent to this story and a lot of problems uh, in, inherent to this history, but there might be some possibility uh, connected to it as well. Um, but it, I was surprised that there had never been a book written about the history of salvage anthropology because so many people in articles and, and in biographies had uh, uh, gestured at it being so significant, but no one had really told the story in this way. And now we'll start a little at the end here to give a, a bit of an indication of why this is consequential. <clears throat> when I did a series of interviews with Native American artists and curators to get different perspectives, on this story and this history, uh, Marie Watt, a Seneca artist who works in textiles, she makes these incredible, almost you know, room, sometimes room-sized sculptures out of blankets and other textiles uh, through a community-oriented practice. She told me in an interview, it's problematic that most people's understanding of American indigenous culture is often limited to the objects in museums and anthropology collections darkly lit under glass rather than direct experience, interaction and engagement with indigenous people in our communities. So, uh, you know, I sort of came to question like, well, how did we get here? Like, how did we get to this, uh, the, this point where people tend to learn about native people in this particular way? Um, and I argued that salvage anthropology has a great deal to do with the, the answer for this. So I'm gonna uh, try to ask today, what is salvage anthropology? Why does it matter? And I'd like for you to hear a few uh, hopefully interesting and compelling stories that are related to this. But at least, you know, if you go uh, later tonight, uh, have dinner with friends or a cocktail, and someone asks you, what did you do today? And you say, I went to a talk about salvage anthropology. Hopefully we'll all know, leave knowing what the heck salvage anthropology is. And in order to do so, or a part of why, uh, you know, sort of the next step uh, is to commit an egregious sin in public speaking. And that is to show you a wall of text in my next slide. But I'm going to underline the important bit, and I'm going to talk about why I'm sort of sharing this. Here is a dictionary definition of what salvage anthropology or the related salvage ethnology is, the sort of science of studying mankind. So a dictionary definition argues that salvage uh, ethnography is an explicit attempt to document the rituals, practices, uh, and uh, myths of cultures facing extinction from dislocation or modernization. And you can see here also that it's commonly associated with a one single individual named Franz Boas, who is a really important German-American anthropologist in the 19th and early 20th century. So that's sort of what I was starting from as a dictionary definition of salvage anthropology. And I'm gonna give you some of the take home points before we even begin. This book ultimately argues that the story of salvage anthropology actually begins a great deal earlier than Franz Boas. It actually begins a generation or two before at least, and is really intimately tied to the story and, and histories of colonialism the expansion of American state westward and uh, global colonialism in a whole variety of other ways. It's not just one individual and their students. This is built up through a vast network or networks of individuals over time. And this is not just some sort of sidebar story in the history of anthropology, right? This, is, this really shapes popular knowledge about indigenous people, about human cultures, about who we are as human beings. And uh, a lot of this is expressed in museums, but we also see it in newspapers and magazines, in public lectures, and in many other spaces as well. And ultimately, this does leave behind this complicated and in many ways problematic archive of materials that we continue to wrestle with today uh, in the United States and elsewhere around the world. 
But again, I want to give us a little bit of an indication of the vastness of this as a history. Um, here is a photograph from the late 19th century from the Bureau of American Ethnology. The BAE, the Bureau of American Ethnology, was a research arm of the Smithsonian Institution tasked with documenting Native American cultures, uh, in part due to the desire to put them onto reservations on the part of the US federal government. Um, but in connection with that, so that uh, desire to explore the American West and document these materials from tribes uh, across the American West especially, uh, there was this effort that uh, involved uh, uh, hiring of anthropologists and collecting of materials from the field, uh, quite literally by the train car load in many instances. So I wanted to ask questions like, well, who are these other people in the photograph? Not just the famous anthropologists that we know about, who are these individuals and what are their stories? Who are the native collaborators uh, in some cases or the people who were in other cases exploited by this process? Um, and what is the, the legacy for that today? So again, I wanna indicate that this is not just some sort of small uh, type of thing. It maybe wasn't as large as other federal government efforts uh, at the same time, but it certainly was not a, a, a sort of small time deal. So again, if we want to step back um, and think about the origins of this story, uh, sometimes when we uh, learn about the history of anthropology in the United States, it's connected to this individual on the, the left, this white uh, individual from uh, New York State named Lewis Henry Morgan. So um, using sort of outdated terminology, sometimes he was often described in early textbooks as the father of American anthropology. So he, uh, as a, 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 a youngish man, he's uh, getting going as an attorney and um, he gets almost, he, he becomes interested almost to the point of obsession with trying to recreate Native American rituals. Um, so he and a club of other white individuals in New York uh, will, you know, dress up and uh, uh, play Indian in the words of one historian. And uh, he wants to learn more about Native American cultures so that their, uh, their sort of games uh, and, and uh, their club activities can be more accurate. Um, and over time, this becomes a pretty heady, serious interest. And he authors what's considered the first American ethnology of uh, the, the Iroquois Confederacy and in particular, it's because he meets at a bookstore, a 15 year old man. Uh, this is a photograph of uh, uh, Eli Parker, uh, uh, much older, but Eli Parker, man, there sh I cannot believe that there isn't a Netflix movie about this individual. He, um, uh, at age 15, he's uh, been at a boarding school for some time. So he is adept at reading and writing English as well as his native language. He introduces anthropologists like Lewis Henry Morgan to actual native people. And wouldn't you know it, that actually meeting Native Americans, he learns all of this fascinating stuff and, and the, the uh, information that he gets by actually talking to people tends to be more accurate and of more interest to people. So Lewis Henry Morgan, this is you know in some ways sort of trivia, but in other ways it indicates how significant he was. It's the only American author that's cited by Sigmund Freud, Karl Marx, and Charles Darwin. So that can sort of indicates how uh, uh, significant his global uh, impact was, but it would, wouldn't be as uh, if not for uh, Eli Parker, who was said to have such great handwriting or apparently, you know, it, it is true he had such great handwriting. I've read his letters and I can attest to that, that um, he, uh, during the, the Civil War, he becomes an aide to uh, General Ulysses S. Grant. He becomes the highest ranking American Indian in uh, the Union uh, uh, forces, and he ends up writing one of the first drafts of the surrender documents signed at the end of the war. Um, so he's just lives this remarkable life history and um, is credited some in uh, Morgan's major writings, but arguably not enough in terms of his facilitating his connection to native elders and information that uh, uh, was considered really valued to scholars around the world. So it was stories like that that I wanted to incorporate more, but then also, you know, sort of so what, right? Um, Lewis Henry Morgan, his ideas about cultural evolution and how cultures work are 
uh, mapped on by the, the later 19th century to the work of the government that I mentioned. This new Bureau of American Ethnology uh, formalizes and takes up this project that are offered by individuals like Lewis Henry Morgan. And as you can see, it becomes bureaucratized and, and, and made into a more official thing where there are a number of ethnologists being hired as well as photographers, clerks, copyists. And uh, I love this task here, a messenger, right? To go around and deliver uh, uh, you know, notes and things like that in the city of Washington, DC where a lot of this activity is no doubt taking place. Um, great. So you can see here, uh, this is a, a, a remarkable image of John Wesley Powell, who was uh, the geologist who, uh, now it, one of the things that kept coming up again and again in this book is sort of these ideas about these disciplines, like this person is a geologist, this person is an anthropologist. These were really blurred in the 19th century and only sort of being figured out and, and invented at the time. So. Um, uh, this individual, uh, 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 Powell, John Wesley Powell, uh, comes uh, back from, uh, he had museum experience before the Civil War, is a Union officer during the Civil War, and you can't quite tell it uh, in this photograph, but he loses his right arm during the Battle of Shiloh. Um, but during a government-led expedition, geological expedition, he's the first white person known to traverse the entire Colorado River through the Grand Canyon. Uh, again, a really remarkable life story, but he becomes more interested in culture and this project to collect and document Native American tribes um, before the time was thought to be too late. So this massive archive is built up over the course of the late 19th and early 20th century of songs and stories, um, uh, photographs, and many other materials, including the writings of these professional anthropologists. Franz Boas. It turned out I couldn't get away from him as hard as I tried. Um, here's another remarkable individual who was once said to get in such a dramatic fight with a student in Germany in the 1930s over an anti-Semitic remark, or you know maybe predating the 1930s by a bit, but uh, an anti-Semitic remark was made. Uh, he gets into a fist fight and has a scar on the side of his face. Um, and people, uh, anthropologists later on say, I don't know if that's true, but it sounds right, knowing Boaz. Um, so he is this brilliant innovator of uh, 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 sort of cultural theory in that he actually goes and lives with Inuit people in Greenland. Um, and he gradually comes to the view that people don't, you know, cultures don't evolve and improve over time, but instead each culture it, it reflects a unique or sort of relative uh, a solution to whatever environmental or social problems that they're presented with. It's a radically different way of thinking about cultures uh, for people in this period and time. So Boaz, as pictured here, is working at a museum demonstrating four mannequins. Actually, Penny and I were talking about mannequins, uh, and, and they're still, of course, used in, in museums to this day, right? How could they not be? Um, but here Boaz is demonstrating some of the poses, the correct poses that the mannequin should be in to, um, uh, to emulate certain ceremonies that he's seen practice firsthand in the Pacific Northwest. So um, again, the story is about documentation, but in many respects, the, the, the story of how things are documented and preserved are through this Western guise, right? Like it's through the guise of the Euro-Americans that are doing the bulk of this collecting. That doesn't mean that there aren't collaborative moments, uh, and that's certainly true with Boaz, but there are other elements that are clearly quite extractive in, in nature. Um, <clears throat> but it, it simply wasn't possible to get away from him. He really was connected with, uh, with almost everything. So um, now just briefly, I wanna switch gears and mention Francis Densmore, who is an ethnomusicologist. Um, this is just this remarkable photograph and I'd like to play just a 30 second audio clip. Um, Densmore, uh, as you can see, in, she, well, she had training in music from the Oberlin Music Conservatory, but um, embraced this new technology of the phonograph and started recording hundreds and hundreds of songs and stories and writing them onto sheet music, but also uh, creating these um, 
uh, uh, wax cylinders, which um, you can hear in the playback that we'll play here for a, a few seconds, the wax cylinder actually turning over and over again. But it's remarkable that we have this as a digitized uh, object in uh, sort of the historical record. So here is an example of a Francis Densmore recording that is now preserved at the Library of Congress. <laughs> So as you might imagine, for uh, an ethnomusicologist today, for Native people today, this is a remarkable thing to have. We'll talk more about possible problems that are associated with these collections, um, but what a remarkable gift in some sense that we have this recording of someone uh, you know, from 100 years ago or more, and we can not just look at a photograph, but encounter it in a uh, an oral sort of um, uh, uh, way as well. It struck me that another interesting thing about salvage anthropology is that people, when they write about art and native people, often reference salvage anthropology when they talk about how painters approach this and photographers approach this as a problem. But there again, nothing had really been written fully on the connection between art and salvage anthropology. So a, a chapter in this book is dedicated to exploring the connections between artists and um, visual imagery and this effort to collect and preserve uh, native people on some level. So George Catlin was a famous uh, painter who uh, painted hundreds of, of paintings. We'll circle back to his, his work in a moment. And Edward Curtis, one of the most uh, uh, remarkable photographers, but a, a great line that I read about Edward Curtis is the most important thing that you need to know about Curtis is that he was taking photographs in the 20th century to make them appear as though they were from the 19th. So already there was an idea about nostalgia and this vision of the past, the sort of idea about the past is fading away. So here is his famous uh, uh, rendering of Geronimo, who by this time had already been photographed driving a Cadillac. Um, but here he is, you know, rendered in uh, blankets in a very, in my view, sort of nostalgic looking uh, uh, rendering. Um, but these weren't just sort of these uh, pictures that, that hung on a wall somewhere and, and were never really seen again. They played an active role in how we began visualizing Native American cultures that, you know, arguably really becomes imbued in later Hollywood presentations and, and other sort of cultural forms. Um, but here is the main Smithsonian lecture hall on the National Mall in at the turn of the century. And what can you see on the walls here? Dozens and dozens of these Curtis paintings. Um, so even if you were going to the Smithsonian to hear a lecture, much as we are at a museum virtually today to hear a lecture, but if you were going to the Smithsonian to hear a lecture about astronomy in the turn of the century, you couldn't help but be, see these Edward Curtis photographs as well. So it really uh, becomes imbued into uh, an element of the national ethos in a way that um, it almost in, in terms of our subconscious, people start to think about native cultures in, in this way. Here you can see the auditorium full uh, with a presentation on Arctic life and culture. So again, I think this really has resonance today. Here is um, uh, the, the remarkable storage facility uh, uh, Probably many people in the audience know this, but if you were to ask people in the general public, uh, most people are unaware that museums can only display in many cases 1% of the collections of, of their material. If you have, uh, you know, 100 spoons in your collection, you might show one or two, and the others might be held behind the scenes in storage. Um, here at the Smithsonian Institution, they do a good job of trying to rotate materials onto exhibit and uh, loaning them out to other museums around the world. But a lot of this is, is, is sort of behind the scenes, right? And that creates an interesting uh, problem and, and dynamic in terms of 
uh, thinking about these uh, as stories. Um, and let me just mention one really fascinating uh, example within that. Uh, an anthropologist uh, at the turn of the century named James Mooney um, worked with over 20 different Native American tribes, but some of his most interesting work took place with the Kiwa uh, uh, in, in the Great Plains. Um, and uh, in for many tribes in the Great Plains, the, the teepee or the lodge is a really consequential thing. It's where you live, it's where a huge amount of your uh, uh, time is spent, um, but also the exterior of that is um, documenting a vision or a, an episode in your life or something important about the family that occupies that teepee or, or lodge. Um, but that is also proprietary to you and your family. So it's not like just some cool design. If someone else in your community copies that design, it's essentially considered plagiarism. Okay, also bison leathers were becoming really difficult to come by in this era. And uh, so James Mooney, as an anthropologist, couldn't just say, hey, I want that teepee cover and I want to take it to the Smithsonian. So what he decides to do is order from Sears and Roebuck uh, the, uh, the best buckskin that he could get, uh, so a smaller sort of leather hide, and he gives them over to tribal elders and historians, and he invites them to paint their own uh, versions onto mini teepee covers. And then he that takes these materials and he sets them up for the public at various locations in major hotels and at fairs where people in Kansas City and in Nashville can come and see this mini village. And now it's one of the millions and millions of objects that are stored behind the scenes uh, at museums like the Smithsonian. But um, one thing that ultimately became very interesting to me is that when we talk about museum history, we often talk about big museums and small museums, but we don't think about within these large national museums, there are also small collections that sometimes don't get as much acknowledgement or uh, time spent on understanding or, or thinking about their significance. So in thinking about this story, one of the, the amazing conversations that I had a chance to have was with a, 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 a scholar and, and curator named Joe Horse Capture at the Autry Museum in Los Angeles. And, you know, I presented him with, um, you know, some of these problems and, and some of the possibilities and, and asked for his reaction. Uh, yeah, he reminded me of this very important thing. He told me, there are many examples of native researchers combing this information and bringing it back to the community. This includes details about ceremonies that are no longer practiced and language resources. If they didn't exist in museums and archives, how would they be brought back to a community? It's a love-hate relationship. So I found that to be a really interesting you know, uh, uh, idea. And I continued to look for other stories that, that indicated um, some of these, you know, tensions and, and contradictions, um, but also, you know, might give us some sense of uh, where this is heading and, and possibility. So a, a couple more stories here to end. Um, I was very moved in reading about the story of a clinket hat. So uh, uh, in the 19th and 20th century, as this salvage anthropology movement is getting going, it's really uh, privileging long-term preservation. Right. This isn't just about sort of the immediacy of the exhibits. This is about the long range um, preservation of these threatened materials. So unfortunately, that meant that in the 19th and 20th century, all organic materials, so wood, leather, feather, would be treated using pesticides, arsenic and mercury, things that are incredibly toxic and hazardous to have you know, uh, near you as a human person, right? But they do, uh, I guess, is the upshot is that they keep pests away from these organic materials. But uh, in, in the present day, when there's a movement to return some of these materials and try to reincorporate them into ceremonies, how can we do that if they are tainted with these uh, historical uh, chemicals? So this really interesting example came up uh, a few, just a few short years ago of a 3D printed hat that uh, is based on a historical hat in the Smithsonian's collection. Here you can see it being uh, scanned, 3D scanned. Some adjustments were made. Uh, they didn't want, I understand, they didn't want it to be an exact replica, but a near copy. And then um, 
uh, this quote was really amazing to me. Our grandchildren will be using this hat down the line. We did ask the old hat if it would treat the new hat like it was its child. So uh, they describe uh, putting this old hat into a dark room overnight with the new hat and inviting it to share some of its knowledge uh, with uh, the younger hat. And I thought that was a really beautiful example of uh, possibility in terms of the story, rather than just purely thinking about uh, the, the limits and the problems that are very real in connection to the story. Another example were these remarkable series of photographs from the late 19th century. Um, tribal delegations visited Washington DC throughout the course of uh, the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, the big picture of this is really tragic and unfortunate in that alcohol and uh, backroom dealings and, and, and um, shady, shady things were often used to uh, create new treaty arrangements that ultimately led to the dispossession of native lands. Um, but it is also the case that there's this really remarkable record of people visiting Washington DC, including this uh, uh, Crow uh, medicine chief. Um, so uh, I connected with an artist, a really remarkable artist named Wendy Redstar, who uh, uh, was born and raised in the Crow community. And she uh, found this image of her ancestral people, but also noted that this same picture was being used to sell books and on tea advertisements and on billboards. She saw it on a billboard in Los Angeles. And that got her thinking about how this material is used and, and reused. So she created a, a blow up digital scans of these historical images and she annotated them with a red pen, dramatically reminding us the things that we should really know when we look at and see these images. Um, including what each piece of uh, uh, clothing uh, represents and, and so forth. Uh, Wendy's a multimedia artist. Some of her sculptures have been at Mass MoCA, but these two images in particular were recently acquired by and on exhibit at uh, the Met in New York, where um, you can go see them up close and you can you know, click around on versions of these and, and read some of the details of this remarkable series. Um, but again, that, that got me curious. So here's a, a, an artist who goes into the archives and mines these materials and responds to them and, and, and talks back to them and encourages us to think about them uh, in distinct sort of ways. So I wanted to have a conversation with Wendy about these histories. And she said to me this really remarkable thing about these objects. From her perspective, she said, I really do feel like we need to give our ancestors more agency. I think they knew what they were doing, and maybe sometimes they were doing things for subversive reasons to maintain the culture. I realized too that this is part of our story, this colonialism and this way of collecting objects, that's part of the object story now too. You can't deny that and you shouldn't. So I, I really found this to be an incredible uh, uh, privilege to write this book um, and, and think about these stories and try to tie them together in some way that was meaningful. Um, I welcome questions in uh, to be plugged in the chat. Um, you know, one of the things I'm asked about most often is like uh, what the writing process was like for this book. So I just have a couple highlight photographs of the process of writing this book. Um, to indicate, you know, what a great, you know, now this is me speaking as an avowed nerd, right? Like I love reading dead people's mail from the, you know, the 19th century, like, and maybe that's not everybody's cup of tea, um, but I absolutely loved going to these museum archives and reading about these debates and interactions and friendships that people had um, and rivalries in terms of uh, this story. I also had a kid along the way. My son Owen came to museum archives for the first time to look at Edward Curtis photographs. I'm grateful for the Smith College Museum of Art for hosting us that day with uh, grandma. Um, but a, a really remarkable journey. I've been thinking about this uh, story for a long time, uh, you know, maybe over 10, 12 years. And one of the things that I'm constantly reminded, right, like these aren't this isn't just a history of ideas or an intellectual history, but these are people living in a material world, right? These are people that are um, encountering change around them, that their uh, cities are their rivals with other cities, their egos where people just don't like one another for one reason. 
Uh, there's a lot of territoriality in, in as, it, as the story plays out in California that was fascinating to read and think about, but being reminded of that. Um, I'm also, you know, maybe one of the last generations to, to learn cursive in elementary school. And my gosh, I am grateful for that as a, uh, as a phenomenon to be able to go back and, and read these letters um, and learn more about uh, how this, um, this story came to be. So the book is available now. It's out and available at local bookstores here in the area, uh, as well as available through Harvard University Press. Um, and wherever books are sold. I've always wanted to say that, so I had to <laughs> squeeze that in. But I would love if people have um, questions that they would like to um, throw out. I see at least one question in the chat. Oh yeah, great. Eli Parker, what a fascinating, can I tell one more Eli Parker story? And what's interesting about him is that there are like tidbits and there's like a 1960s era biography and because he was served in, uh, in General Grant's staff, he uh, was sort of occasionally would appear in like the gossip pages of major newspapers. So he once apparently stood up a bride to be at the altar in New York City in like the 1870s. And this was like a mini sort of uh, a celebrity scandal in the pages of New York City newspapers. But one more real story about him is that Apparently, the way he got reconnected with General Grant is that General Grant, as a civilian in the immediate years leading up to the Civil War, uh, was in a bar fight. And Eli Parker heard the ruckus and stepped in and helped fend off the attackers. And they became fast friends after that. They apparently were acquaintances. But it was a bar fight that, that it feels like Western saloon style. But um, you know, I think maybe it happened in New York someplace. But um, what a remarkable story that is to show sometimes how small the world can be. And um, uh, it's interesting. Uh, Lewis Henry Morgan always had these political ambitions, but it was his younger friend that um, ascends through some of the ranks, but is always pretty shy about. Um, he, he doesn't seem to really want to be commissioner of Indian affairs. Yeah. All right, I'm seeing a couple more questions in the oh, chat. Oh yeah. Um, from Jessica, could you directly clarify what was problematic about the process of salvage and for the apology at this time? What about today? I assume we still do this at times. That's a great question. Thank you for asking that question. So, well, there there's a lot of possibility, and um, you know there are some examples in, that I quote in the book of people that are Yurok elders that say outright, "I'm glad that some 19th century anthropologists studied and published this material, so I have access to it." That is certainly the case, but I think as that Marie Watt uh, quote indicated at the the top of the uh, conversation here today, that the um, Part of the issue is that uh, Native people still live in the world today, and they are doing, you know, many of the same things, right, as the rest of us do. But we tend to think of them as, in the past, uh, staid, historical, noble. Um, we tend to have certain ideas about who Native people are at, that. Um, create expectations that are maybe unhealthy for people to live up to or misguided. Um, and yeah, so that's why I think there, there create some, some problems with this. It's also the case that that information in um, advocacy for federal recognition, that information recorded by a linguist, let's say, was privileged over oral tradition from the tribes themselves. So, you know, there are ways in which that uh, this creates faulty assumptions about who people are. I mean, it's an outside gaze, right? Uh, 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 you know, almost exclusively. I mean, there's collaboration, but this involves a white person coming in and, and learning a language and trying to explain this culture. Um, it's sort of like a game of complex game of telephone, right? With that string wire, there are going to be things that are miscommunicated and, and misunderstood in that process. So yeah, that's a really valuable question. And I think, you know, the we're, we're still engaging in this practice today, right? Like there's uh, uh, people that are still trying to preserve or recover languages, um, but we're, um, I think in some cases we've learned from some of the mistakes of the past in other cases, maybe not as well as we should have. But uh, I think one of the take home points here is collaboration. 
that it can't just be elite institutions, white scholars at elite institutions that sort of land in these places and take what they need and, and bolt. Um, it needs to involve uh, the voices of the community all the way through and, and the control of those materials, especially sacred materials and ancestral human remains, um, the control of the, 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 the future of those materials should rest with uh, the tribes themselves. So yeah, that's a great question. Great, and yeah, and I'm really grateful to um, uh, Rebecca Stone Gordon as well from Washington DC. Um, and yeah, I think that, you know, I, like I say, what a fascinating um, set of characters and, and people and, and problems. Um, yeah, I couldn't get some of them out of my head in a good and bad way, I guess. All right, do we have any, any more questions? from folks. I feel like the presentation was very comprehensive, a great crash course, uh, and I'm looking forward to getting the book and to read it. Yeah. Let's see, I do see one more question here. Okay. Oh, yeah, great. I'm, I appreciate hearing this particular question. So the relationship between salvage anthropology and the emergence of salvage archaeology or archaeology just as a field. So I'd love to just address that question before we wrap up. So, um, at the middle of the 20th century, sort of ironically, like as salvage anthropology or salvage ethnography, the sort of cultural work is fading in some sense, there's this growing um, uh, idea of uh, salvage archaeology, especially as it relates to the construction of major dam projects, both in the American West, but also in Egypt and elsewhere around the world. And this sparks more of a conversation about how uh, part of the salvaging uh, needs to be of these historical materials. And there is some conversation in the 60s and 70s, like what can salvage archeology span learn from these older efforts in ethnography and collecting in language and, and in music and things like that. Um, some people argue that some of the really core modern tenets of archeology span really came to be in that moment and in connection with these uh, changes that are happening in that, in that moment. But again, as your question suggests, right, that there, there is this emphasis that's in so many respects extractive, right? Um, uh, people in California with salvage archeology span projects are saying we need this for the state collection and so that it doesn't go east or abroad. Um, uh, but they're not necessarily, or in many cases, especially in the 60s and 70s, uh, attuned to the concerns of the native people that are still occupying those lands or consider those lands as uh, uh, sacred home sites. Um, so yes, as early as the 1930s, archaeologists are talking about this. In the 60s and 70s, it starts to come up a lot more. Um, but it's, it's a, 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 a thread that runs through the book, but if not a main sort of uh, focus of the book. But I appreciate that question, Travis. Thank you. I wanted to make sure to answer all those questions before, uh, before we wrap up today. But I really appreciate the opportunity to come and chat with folks today about this book. And um, I hope people enjoy it and reach out if there's something interesting in the book or they have any other questions. I, I can't wait to read it, Sam. Thank you so much for being with us today and enlightening us on salvage anthropology. <laughs> all right. All right. Um, all right. I think that's, that's it. And uh, thanks again. And uh, hopefully we can do something with you again in the future. I'd love to come back in person too. Terrific. All can't right. Wait. All right. Talk to you guys soon. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.